What's good? My name is Christian Baches, and in this video, we'll be diving headfirst into the world of street art to study the legend himself, Matt Deed, also known as Kipto. Now, if you're not familiar with Kipto's mind-blowing larger-than-life murals and highly detailed paintings, I've included some on the screen right now, and today, I'll be taking his inspiration and turning it into my very own masterpiece. I'm absolutely fascinated by his unique style and want to decode the magic behind it. To start, I've given myself a few rules to follow based on some of his past works. One, we're adopting Kipto's iconic color palette. Think bold reds, blues, and yellows. These hues are really gonna bring our artwork to life. Rule number two, we can't forget those mesmerizing naked figures that he often includes. Rule number three, symmetry is our secret weapon. Just like Kipto, we're diving into the art of composition to create those visually captivating scenes. Rule number four, let's not overlook the animal kingdom. Inspired by Kipto's Animal Instinct show, we're bringing an animal into our piece for that extra flair. Rule number five, we're pushing ourselves to add that gritty, raw texture that makes Kipto's art so dynamic. So with these rules in mind, let's get creative. I've fired up my trusty iPad and started sketching out our game plan. To start, I've got a soft spot for tigers and they're gonna take center stage. Drawing from my recent trip to Colombia, I'm incorporating some meaningful symbols like jeeps and vultures. Of course, we gotta keep that Kipto vibe going, so we got feathers cascading from the tiger. At the bottom, a powerful nude figure emerges atop a sort of cylinder shape. I've also added hands extending from the top corners, emphasizing those fantastic triangle shapes. And of course, I couldn't resist throwing in some splatters and random marks to finish it off. Let's talk about the color palette. I've got a thing for purple in my pieces, so I decided to build my colors around that. In Procreate, I carefully selected a triad color palette centered around that captivating shade of that I love. But what really caught my eye were the vivid blue and greenish yellow hues that I knew would add incredible depth and contrast to my pieces. So I grabbed my trusty golden fluid acrylics and mixed up these vibrant colors in real life. I even used this random canvas I had laying around to compare them to get the perfect balance. Now onto the spray paint. I wanted colors that would stand out and complement my acrylic palette. So I went for a bold, bright yellow and some deep, moody blue. I started channeling that Kipto grittiness by using the back of the spray can to scratch into the semi-dry paint. It was all about adding that unique texture and energy to the piece. Sure, most of this might get covered up, but it's all about the process and having fun with art. To make sure my acrylic paint would stick perfectly to the canvas, I covered it with a matte medium. You see, I've had some sticky situations with this in past projects, so I just wanted to make sure I got it right this time. I started with this circle because, you know, it's all about laying down the groundwork for this epic piece. And if there's one thing I learned from legends like Kipto, it's that you gotta work from back to front to make these forms really pop like crazy. I decided to add some drip texture action. Why, you ask? Well, maybe it's because it's pouring rain in the scene, or maybe it's just to add that extra layer of intrigue, but who knows? I would usually use a grid for a piece like this, but for this one, I decided against it. I found it really fun to carve out all these components that I had already painted. I think painting this digitally beforehand was really helpful in getting me to get through all those issues that I otherwise would have had to deal with on the canvas itself. Coming up with the elements, the composition, and the colors beforehand was really helpful because when I got to painting, I was more so focusing on the texture and sort of the, the way I was painting as opposed to what I was going to paint. And this was a really different approach than I was normally used to, so I think I would definitely try this again in a future piece. I feel like I should get used to talking to the camera a little bit, so um, I'll commentate a little bit live in person. Uh, I'm really happy with this part. The sky is great. Um, the sketch is getting there. Um, and another thing is that I really wasn't happy with these wings too much, especially in the main sketch. Um, so my plan now is to do some Google searching to find some more realistic ones and just insert those in. So that's the plan. I'm not sure why I didn't use a reference photo for the wings, um, because I did use one for the tiger, the vultures, and the car. And I think they ended up looking really bland in the digital sketch, so I'm happy that I went back and sort of made them a lot more realistic. There came a point where I realized that I left too much negative space in the piece when transferring it from the digital to the physical world. So there were two really important Kipto-esque features that I decided to implement. One of them was this face at the top of this tiger's head that maybe could be the woman also at the bottom. The second thing I added were fists to the side of the tiger, so it looks like he's sort of holding something. 
I think it adds really to the fierceness and the power of this tiger and uh, the storytelling aspect because maybe the things that he's holding has something to do with the story. Instead of putting this piece flat horizontally and splattering some acrylic paint on it, I went for a sputtering uh, spray paint texture to go alongside these forms that I'm building up. I made sure to do this before anything was really filled in so that I would avoid having issues and they could really stay in the background. I then decided to lean into the strong burly tiger figure and decided to give it a chest to complement the arms and hands that I was giving him. At this point, I was just really enjoying the process. This is such a super fun way to approach painting with these pre-mixed colors and I was just grooving along. And we are at that point in the video where I have to remind you to hit that subscribe and like button because it really helps out the channel, helps me out, and I greatly appreciate it, so thank you. One tactic that I also went for was starting from dark and moving to light. So I started off with a lot of those sort of dark blue, the, the dark blue color that I chose and the dark purples, um, because when you add those lighter colors on top, they sort of pop even more. So you could see me doing that a lot here. I also wanted to mention that even though I said everything was going to be symmetrical, I sort of deviated from that because I think it just adds something to the piece if each side sort of isn't the same. What am I thinking of right now? I really want to start adding things to the hands at the top. So I thought of adding some sort of scaly. Also, I would love to add more texture into that background because right now it seems a little flat. I tried using a little bit of spray paint, but I'm not sure if it worked too well. So let's get to it. Back at the canvas, I already had these hands and arms sort of drawn in and filled in a little bit. Um, so it was sort of easy to draw in the scaliness that I wanted to to add on top of them. Um, and from there, I sort of was trying out different colors, trying to see what would work, uh, trying to experiment with, you know, potentially adding the green on top of the purple um, to see what that would do. And I think it gives it a different feeling than the rest of the items. I think it's also important to mention things that I struggle with. Um, I talked about how I was going from dark to light, but um, I realized in some certain parts that I didn't really have a plan. So I started off with the median value, um, and sort of had to bring back in the darker one. So you see me sort of fumbling around a little bit. I loved adding these, this pink color on top of this sort of middle purple value. I wanted to take some time to talk about the importance of doing projects like this. Um, when we talk about older paintings, people often do studies of them, right? So they sit in front of it and they just paint what they see, try to mimic those techniques. Um, but with sort of YouTube artists, uh, online social, social media artists, it's sort of difficult to get in front of their works. So uh, this is a version of that, right? A version of studying his work, but it's more so a culmination of me watching his videos and sort of deciphering some specific tech techniques and, and sort of visual language and using that in my own style, right? Using my own references, my own um, compositional techniques, right? Things that I've learned. Um, and creating a final piece from it. For me, in terms of attribution, I think uh, this is a, a distinct piece for me, um, but it's definitely inspired by Kipto and anywhere that I will put this or uh, maybe sell it eventually, or especially on my website, it will say that this was highly influenced by the man himself. You know, Kipto has been such a great influence for me in my art career so far. Uh, I loved his podcast with Slu that he did. I thought that was really informative and and, um, and really motivating. And I really want to travel the world and paint like he has. It's funny, earlier on in the video, I mentioned a trip to Colombia that I did. And that would have not been possible if I didn't watch his video about going to Colombia and painting for the Polychromia Tour. Even funnier, as I'm recording this, I just finished submitting a Fulbright application to study in Colombia to paint a bunch of murals for eight months. And I wrote a lot about how Kipto really influenced me to make that happen. So it's always fun doing projects like this, right? It's a sort of shout out, it's a sort of nod to that uh, early influence that I had. You know, when it comes to actually painting this work, this has to be one of my fastest. Um, just of painting, it took about two days. Maybe the whole process took about a week. But this sort of style, this technique is really revolutionary in planning out and thinking about the way you're gonna paint this beforehand.
update. Uh, I think I'm happy with it so far. Uh, and I'm just going to continue to, you know, push those values, um, make it happen. I basically freehand sketched everything in this piece, including the car at the top. And it came to a point where I just wasn't happy with how it was looking. Um, it just looked a little wonky, like a, like a little toy car. So I decided to just cover over it and uh, paint it new. Luckily, this was pretty simple as I had the perfect color for that circle background. So I just sort of filled it in. Um, and you'll see me using a technique known as doodle gridding. Doodle gridding is a technique that I think was developed by street artists uh, to essentially get their design onto walls. Um, as opposed to using the regular gridding method where you sort of mark things out an inch or a foot, whatever. Uh, this is just sort of making doodles, taking a picture and then using uh, the beauty of transparency to put your image of whatever you wanted to draw on top of that. Um, so that's what I did here. I luckily already had painted this car, so it was just smooth sailing once I got those outlines in. And you could see the time lapse of the digital rendition that I actually made, um, that I showed earlier on the video, but I'll show it here again. Um, and it's all about building up those values, right? Starting off with the dark purple and the dark blue, and then using the mid-tones, and then, you know, going brighter and brighter. I remember I used to hate painting and drawing cars just because there was so much detail and I just had so much difficulty grasping that. Um, but it was after a mural that I painted at my college called Jonathan R. Duchatelier, where I painted a car and I used the same technique and it worked out beautifully. So here we are again. I want to talk a little bit about storytelling. Throughout this video, I've been mentioning how some features might be a nod to some sort of story, story element. Um, and it might sound a little weird from like an outsider, a non-artist hearing this, but uh, in art school, I was taught, well, it wasn't art school, um, but in my art classes, I was taught that pieces should be open uh, for interpretation, but they should also have sort of very distinct qualities that, um, that reference some sort of story. It's sort of that balance of having recognizable objects and them flowing in a certain compositional way. Um, but also leaving it up to interpretation because that keeps people sort of engaged longer, thinking about it longer. Maybe they'll take it home with them, um, you know, in their mind, maybe physically if they want to. So when we talk about storytelling, you know, there isn't one story that I want to tell with this piece, but it's a sort of, it's whatever the viewer who's interpreting it sees in this. As we're nearing the end of this video, I just wanted to thank you all so, so much again. Uh, for watching and without further ado let's see the final piece inspired by Kipto.